Hello everyone, my name is Ned Dimitrov and I'm a professor at the Operations Research Department at the Naval Pulse Graduate School. And today I'll tell you a little bit about nuclear smuggler detection, which is a problem I've been working on for the last four or five years. This is a graph produced by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So on the horizontal axis here is uh, dates, so time increasing on the right. And on the vertical axis is counts of confirmed criminal instances involving nuclear smuggling activities. And so what I mostly want you to get from this graph is that nuclear smuggling actually does happen on a regular basis. There's maybe about 25 or 30 incidents per year throughout the world. And you might say, well, what are these instances? Well, the IAEA used to publish a report that had short one-sentence summaries of the criminal instances, but they've uh, stopped publishing that report in early 2000. But this is what that report said before they pulled it off uh, the internet. So uh, on the horizontal axis, we have just different instances of uh, nuclear smuggling activity in various different countries. On the vertical axis, we have the amount of material in a logarithmic scale. So uh, right here is about uh, a gram, 10 grams, and so forth. And the blue bars represent highly enriched uranium, and the red bars represent weapons-grade plutonium. And so what I want you to get from this graph is that people are, in fact, trying to smuggle nuclear material that can be made into a weapon and in fact some of the quantities are quite large so for example over here we have kilogram quantities in some of these events and some of these smaller events uh, this one for example what happens is that the seller is providing a sample of the material to the buyer so it's a very small amount but that amount is meant for the buyer just to check out the material and then a much larger amount can be delivered later so um, really smuggling does happen it does happen with materials that we should be worried about and it happens in quantities that we should be worried about because of this in 2005 the US government set up the domestic nuclear detection office so this is an office that's charged with preventing nuclear smuggling both domestically and abroad. It has a budget of about $2.8 billion, and its tasks are to combat nuclear smuggling internationally and domestically. And it does this with a number of different activities. For example, it develops a global nuclear detection architecture. And by this, I mean that uh, the DNDO and the Department of Energy work with foreign governments to install nuclear detection capabilities overseas. So for example, um, in a port like Singapore, the US government would work with the Singaporean authorities to try to set up nuclear detection equipment there so that no one can smuggle material through Singapore into the United States. They also characterize detector system performance. As I'll tell you in a little bit, there's a vast difference between the different technologies that you can use to detect nuclear materials. And so the DNDO spends some of its money trying to understand exactly which technologies are most effective at identifying the nuclear material. It also facilitates information sharing between different organizations. So for example, the DNDO will help train local law authorities on how to use nuclear detection equipment, how the entire US government system works in terms of uh, preventing these kinds of smuggling activities. And number four, it conducts transformational research and development, both in terms of developing new detection technologies and deploying those technologies throughout the world. So let me spend a little bit of time telling you about some of the technologies used to detect nuclear materials. There's generally two broad categories of nuclear detectors. The first is what's called passive detectors. So imagine that this ball on the right is the nuclear material. And just because of uh, fission that happens inside that material, Every once in a while, we get some radioactive particles that are moving out of the material in various directions. Over here, this yellow bar represents a detector that we've set up. And some of these particles are going to go in directions that we don't see. But every once in a while, we're going to get a particle that goes in a direction of the detector and hits the detector. And whenever the particle hits the detector, 
what happens is that detector produces a little electrical charge. And that electrical current that the detector produces can then get uh, seen by some electronics behind it and get counted. So for example, whenever you've seen in movies people with a Geiger counter going click, 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 what's going on is that every one of those clicks is one of these particles hitting the detector, causing some electrical current and causing one of these clicks to happen. And there's a vast, vast difference between how effective different materials are at producing these electrical currents and how effective different uh, detector setups are for being able to see, for example, which direction the uh, material and the radiation is coming from. So just to give you one example of this difference, it turns out that different nuclear materials produce particles with different energies. So if I had here plutonium, the particles that come out of plutonium would be very different in terms of energy than the particles that come out of uranium. So in this graph here, on the bottom axis, I have different energy bins. So you can think of this as uh, little sections of energy. And then on the vertical axis, I have counts. So what happens is when a particle hits the detector with a particular energy, what we're going to do is bump up the count in that particular bin. And it turns out that if you look at this energy spectrum, you can identify exactly what kind of material is producing that radiation. So it gives you a way of knowing what the radioactive material is without actually looking at it. But of course, this is only possible if you have a very special kind of detector. So in this graph that I'm showing you, the detector has many, many different bins. And so it gave us a lot of fidelity in being able to see what kind of energies hit the detector. But a cheaper detector might only have maybe two energy bins. So imagine this graph, but with only two bins, one on the left and one on the right, and just one is bigger than the other, uh, and you wouldn't be able to tell very much about the material that way. So knowing what kind of energy is very much a property of the material used in the detector and influences how expensive the detector is. Other things that influence how expensive the detector is, is being able to identify, for example, what direction this particle hit the detector from, which then lets you localize where exactly uh, this source of radiation is. So just to give you some examples of real world passive detectors, uh, on the bottom right here is just a little handheld one. So uh, this is one that's more like the Geiger counters that you might've seen in movies. On the top left here is what's called a radiation portal monitor. So uh, these are very big detectors, both on the left and right, that essentially all cars and trucks that enter US border crossings drive through one of these radiation portal monitors. And uh, the portal monitor is basically counting how much radiation is coming off that car. And if it happens to be more than normal, more than what's expected, then an alarm gets sounded and uh, further search might happen with that vehicle, maybe with one of these handheld detectors to see what exactly is causing that radiation. Uh, over here is another portal monitor, kind of like this one, but it's portable. So it's mounted on top of a truck. So you could, for example, drive this along the highways to see if any car on the highway happens to be producing more radiation than it should. And uh, on the bottom here, we have a picture of a train with one of these portal monitors. So one of the things I also want to bring up is that how effective these passive detectors is very much a function of the environment that you place it in. So for example, when a train comes through the detector, if it goes through very fast, then there's not going to be very much time for particles to hit the detector. And so we might not see the material even if it's there. Or maybe many of the particles get stopped by the metal that's naturally in the train and don't hit the detector. And so that's why we don't see the material. So uh, the environment of the detector makes a big difference as to how effective it is. The other general category of nuclear detectors are active detectors. So these are different because instead of just waiting for radiation to come out of the source, what happens in an active detector is we have... <coughs> we shoot some kind of radiation or energy at the source and then we look at the way that that energy bounces off. So again, these 
yellow bars are different detector detectors. This is our gun shooting energy at the source. And that energy bounces in some particular ways. And when it bounces, uh, it causes these electrical currents. And then we sense those and we can tell something about the material. For example, what's its composition, what's its density, etc. So just to give you some examples of active detectors, so the first one you're very familiar with. So an x-ray, for example, is an active detector. So whenever you go through an airport screener and they x-ray your bags, what they're doing is shooting energy at your bags and looking at what bounces off and that produces the image. And so in the picture here on the top left is an x-ray very much like the ones you've seen at an airport, but much, much bigger. So this one is made for scanning entire cargo containers. So here's the picture that you might produce of a truck uh, being scanned by one of these very large uh, x-rays. And in this scan, you might identify, oh, here's a particular place where I have something that's very dense, and maybe I should go and investigate that further. Or it turns out that depending on what kind of radiation you shoot, maybe you don't shoot x-rays, maybe you shoot neutrons or something like that, uh, you can actually identify the exact elements that make up uh, this particular material. So on the bottom here, I have another example of an active detector where the radiation source, instead of coming from the side as it does in this x-ray, it actually comes from the bottom. Uh, and in this particular one, it's uh, neutrons that are coming out. And uh, on the bottom right here is maybe one of the most interesting combinations of uh, active and passive detection that I've seen. So this detector uses by uh, works by using particles that just naturally occur. So these particles are called muons. They're given off by the sun and they regularly pass through us. They just are constantly, uh, the earth is constantly being hit by these particles and they tend to interact more with denser material than they do with less dense material. So most of the time they don't hit anything, but if the material is very dense, every once in a while they'll hit it slightly and deflect. And so the way that this detector works is it has some panels at the top and some panels at the bottom. And when one of these muons comes in, the detector notices what angle it came in. And then if it hits something and bounces off, it notices what angle it came out on. And by combining these angles, the in angle and the out angle, it can actually form a picture of what's in the middle here. And the reason that this is an interesting combination of active and passive detection is because there's no gun here. We're just using these naturally occurring particles to produce an image very much like an x-ray without actually exposing the cargo to anything extra that it wouldn't be exposed to uh, anyways. And uh, this detector was developed at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So of course we have all these strategies for detecting material of these various technologies, but the bad guys also have a strategy. In particular, they can put a shield around their material. So that's what this black circle represents. And so when some radiation now comes off the material, it's going to get stopped by the shield. And so no radiation is going to come to our detector. There's no electricity that gets made. And uh, it's as though there's no material here. It's basically the radioactive material gets hidden by the shield. And just to give you an example that this shielding really does make a big difference, consider these two pictures. So on the bottom here, we have lead shielding thickness in terms of centimeters, so thicker shielding to the right. And on the vertical axis, we have detection probability. So this is the probability that the detector is going to sound an alarm that there is actually some kind of radioactive material there. And so if you look at weapons grade plutonium, uh, as we increase the thickness, even at a two centimeter thickness, event, the detector is going to notice that plutonium because uh, two centimeters of lead is just not enough to hide some plutonium. Uh, the radiation is going to escape past the shielding. But as you increase the uh, thickness of the shielding, the likelihood of detecting the material goes down and when you go about to four, about four centimeters of shielding the detector is probably not going to see it. And a similar thing happens with highly enriched uranium but now notice that the horizontal axis is very different. So for highly enriched uranium even 0.3 of a centimeter of 
lead shielding, which is way, way down here uh, for the weapons grade plutonium. Even this small amount of shielding is going to eventually, uh, essentially, stop your detector from seeing the material. And so, as you can see, how much shielding you need is very much dependent on the kind of material you're trying to hide or the bad guy is trying to hide. And also, whether our detector sees the material or not is dependent on that amount. So now that we know a little bit about the detection technology, a very nice or natural question to ask is, how do we use this technology? If somebody gave us a budget of, let's say, $10 million to try to buy some of this technology and use it, how can we do that best? And that's where operations research comes in, and that's what really I'm an expert on. So uh, the idea of operations research is that we're going to optimize operations through mathematical models. So just to give you some historical examples of that, operations research really came out of World War II. So typical questions that operations research answered during World War II are things like, they looked at bombers returning from bombing runs in Europe, and they tried to figure out where should we put additional armor on these planes so that they don't get shot down. So the nice and interesting story here is that you might think, okay, I'll look at the returning planes, and I'll look at uh, where they have bullet holes, and that's where I will put extra armor. But it turns out that that thinking uh, actually isn't the right kind of thinking. Uh, the right kind of thinking is that you look at the returning planes and you put the armor where they don't have bullet holes because planes that had bullet holes in those places didn't return. So uh, you really want to armor the places that didn't have bullet holes. And uh, this really came out of some statistical models and some mathematical thinking uh, during World War II. But other questions that got answered was, uh, how high should bombers fly? Uh, is it worth it for them to fly lower and be more effective uh, in being more accurate with dropping the bombs, or should they be uh, a little bit higher? How, what should the depth charge settings be when trying to fight a submarine? And uh, if I'm trying to find a submarine and I have several boats and airplanes, how do I deploy those boats and airplanes to most quickly find that submarine? Uh, and in today's talk, I'll tell you a little bit about mathematical models used to stop nuclear smugglers. So here's the abstract nuclear smuggling detection problem. So we're given a transportation network, so that's what's pictured here in green. All of these little edges are the road networks of United States, Canada, and Mexico. And on each edge, we're going to have a uh, local law detection probability. So this is the likelihood that a smuggler that just moves through that edge is going to get detected by local uh, law enforcement just because they got pulled over on the side of the highway or somebody talked to them. And this is going to be a small number, but it might change in different parts of the network. So maybe this particular state has a better law enforcement than that one, so uh, the law detection probabilities there are slightly higher than in this one. We also might have a set of origins. So in this picture, those origins are in red, uh, and a set of destinations. And in this picture, those uh, destinations are in yellow. So uh, an origin might be some kind of nuclear facility that the smuggler has taken the material from. And a destination might be where they want to get that material to. So it could be a port if they're trying to smuggle it out of the country. Uh, it could be a major city if they're trying to pull off an attack, something like that. Uh, and of course, the sources and destinations that are shown in this picture are just notional. I've just made them up for an example. And the basic question is, on which border crossing should we place a limited number of detectors? Ultimately, we don't have budget to place the detectors everywhere. So what's the best place to place them uh, if we only have a small budget? And the answer, of course, critically depends on the way that the smugglers move through this transportation network. And in this picture here, we've just placed one detector uh, up here in the top right. So the key problem with trying to answer this question on where should we put these detectors is that we don't really know how smugglers behave. So it's very difficult to validate a movement model for the smuggler. And there's a number of reasons for this. The first is that there's essentially no unclassified data on nuclear smuggler movement. Uh, 
And even if there were all the uh, unclassified data in the world, if you take that, it turns out that ultimately smuggling events are rare. They don't happen that often. Not only that, when they happen, they happen uh, because of different organizations and different individuals are involved. And so you can't just run some kind of large scale statistical model and figure out, oh, most smugglers use this route because there might only be five smugglers a year or something like that. Because of this, uh, the original smuggler movement models were based on the conservative maximum reliability path model. So these were developed in the early 2000s by a group at the University of Texas at Austin. So what do I mean by this maximum reliability path model? The idea is that we're going to assume that the smuggler knows everything. In particular, we're going to assume that the smuggler knows those local law enforcement probabilities and he's going to pick a path from a source to his destination that maximizes his likelihood of not getting caught. So in this picture, these red paths represent smuggler movements from sources to destination, and whenever the path gets thicker, it means that more smugglers would be using that path. And uh, the fact that we have these many sources and many destinations represents the fact that we don't really know where the smuggler is starting and where he's going to. So. Uh, you can think of these red lines as really likelihoods. So if it's very thick, then it means that it's more likely that the smuggler would be using that path. So in the conservative movement model, the smuggler computes the best path, the one that's most likely for him to avoid detection to move from his origin to his destination. And when we place some detectors, for example, these in blue here, the smuggler knows exactly where we've placed the detectors and is going to optimally walk around them. So for example, these smugglers that start here, they move in this direction, then just walk around their detectors to get to the locations where they need to go. So why would you assume that the smuggler knows where the detectors are? Well, uh, this picture, is from uh, the early 2000s. So in the early 2000s, the United States placed some nuclear detection uh, equipment on Russian border crossings. And at the time this happened, uh, this is uh, Russian officials. They're just having a ribbon cutting ceremony for this nuclear detector that was placed in Moscow airport. So uh, as you can see, these things get announced quite widely in the press. And even if they don't get announced widely in the press, it's reasonable to assume that the smuggler smart has spent some time doing intelligence and has figured out exactly where these nuclear detectors are. So that's why people went with this conservative maximum reliability path model. Uh, this model assumes a smuggler that knows everything, so he's omniscient. And he also can control his route very, very carefully. So he can control his route to move exactly around the detectors that you've placed there. So he's omnipotent in that sense. Uh, he uh, can control himself very, very well. And the nice thing about this model is that it bounds the probability that any smuggler gets through. In some sense, this is the worst smuggler you can face. So any other smuggler is going to do worse. So let me just show you a brief movie of what kind of detector placements you get from this kind of model. So in this movie, again, the red dots represent origins, the yellow dots represent destinations, and uh, these red lines represent routes for the smuggler. So as I play the movie, what's going to happen is we're going to increase the amount of detectors we have available to put on the network. And you'll see at the beginning, we're going to start putting some detectors up here. So let's see that. And as we place detectors, you can see that the smuggler's route keeps adjusting. And once we have a certain number of detectors, for example, we're building up here in the Northeast, and whenever we have enough detectors, all of a sudden, we're going to move all of those detectors to the Mexico border because that's where they're most effective. It's, they're only effective as a group. If you only had one or two detectors, you wouldn't put them down there. But as a group, they're very, very effective down there. And uh, as we increase, the number of detectors we keep working here and you'll see in a little bit when we get enough detectors all of a sudden we'll switch them all to the west coast here which again shows you that really the way that you place detectors really matters in terms of a group and not in terms of an individual detector
And so as we increase the number of detectors, we keep working here on the East Coast until we close off the uh, entire US border. So there's, a, there's ultimately a problem with this, which is that when you look at that, if you had nine detectors, you would put them in the Northeast. But if you had 10 detectors, you would put them in Mexico. And this is kind of a problem because we want to build infrastructure sequentially. These detectors are very expensive. It takes some time to build them. And so once you put them in a border crossing, we don't want to go back and somehow move them to some other location afterwards. So we want to build this infrastructure sequentially. And at the beginning, we don't know how many total detectors we'll have. So at the beginning, we might just buy one or two. And then when some more funding comes later, I might buy three more. And more funding comes later, I might buy two more. So I don't know the total number of detectors at the beginning. So we really need mathematical models that account for this. So let me just give you an idea of how a mathematical model might account for this. So this is a very, very simple model of placing facilities uh, to achieve some goal. So in this particular idea, uh, imagine that on this graph, in each little square, we have a person. And I'd like to place a facility so that it's closest to all of these people that are uh, on the graph. So this is just a very simple uh, problem that doesn't have anything to do with smugglers, but just illustrates the idea of placing infrastructure sequentially. So if I had to place just one facility, what I would do is just place it in the middle because that's what's closest to everybody in the picture. If I had two facilities, I would place them at these two X's because that's what makes everybody closest to their closest facility. If I had three facilities, I would do it in this triangle optimally. And if I had four, I would do it in this rectangle. So as you can see, this is the same idea that if you had one, you'd put it here. But if you had two, you'd move this one and you would put uh, the two right there. So a mathematical model that does this sequentially might do this. For the first facility, it puts it very close to the center, but not exactly. So that's what happens right here. So it's not exactly in the center, but it's close to. And uh, the second facility gets put up here. So you can see that this solution is both very close to the one facility solution and very close to the two facility solution. Then when you have your third facility, maybe you place it here. And then uh, your fourth facility, you do like that, one, two, three, and four. So this is the idea of building up infrastructure sequentially. So let's see what solutions for nuclear detectors look like when you build them up sequentially. In this movie, you can interpret the dots in the same way. So red dots are origins, yellow dots are destinations, and blue dots are detectors. The network here is a little bit different than the last movie. We're using the US rail network instead of the US road network. And now you can see that the solutions are sequential. We never move a detector once we've placed a detector. And given this, it turns out to be optimal to first target the US-Mexico border, then work on this part of the Canadian border, and eventually just work your way up to the East Coast, placing detectors in those various locations. So this kind of solution makes a lot more sense in terms of developing detector infrastructure than the non-nested solutions we saw before, even though it's slightly less optimal than the previous one. So this conservative maximum reliability path model has some problems with it. In particular, maybe not all smugglers are smart. Maybe some smugglers are just bumbling smugglers. And because we're concentrating on catching these very smart ones, we're somehow missing the, the ones that aren't so smart. So let's just consider a randomly walking smuggler. So the smuggler starts at one of these origins and he just walks randomly. And then if he gets to a destination, great. And if he doesn't get to a destination, he keeps walking. So this is an example of a solution that's targeted for a one of these randomly walking smugglers. So you can see that this solution has a very different kind of structure than the one 
that's made for a smart smuggler, in particular because it left these holes. So it has these holes, and a smart smuggler, what they would do is they would just walk into one of these holes. But this random walker, since he's bouncing around, he doesn't have control to actually focus his movement into one of the openings that are left at the border. So let's see how badly solutions that are made for these very smart smugglers do against these not so smart smugglers. So in this picture the vertical axis is the probability of smuggler success and the horizontal axis is the number of detectors. This blue line represents the performance of a conservative smuggler against a conservative solution. So this is a smart smuggler. So it bounds the probability that any other smuggler is going to get through, which means that any other smuggler has to be down here in this graph. So this is the randomly walking smuggler that's down here. So now let's zoom in a little bit. So what I've done in this picture is I've just looked at the conservative solution versus the randomly walking smuggler and I've normalized it so that when there's zero detectors he's going to uh, get through with a probability of one. So as you can see he gets through with a very high probability here against the conservative solution but against a solution that's customized for one of these randomly walking smugglers with very few detectors we catch him. So if we just spent a little bit of effort focusing on these not-so-smart smugglers, we can catch them very well. And if in fact most smugglers are these not-so-smart ones, then we're not catching smugglers very well at all with our solution that's made for these very smart smugglers. So here's maybe another way to handle the fact that we don't know how smugglers ultimately are going to move what we're going to do is we're going to create a family of movement models. So this is going to include those very smart smugglers that take the maximum reliability path. It's going to include all those smugglers that just randomly walk and are not so smart and a whole family of models that are in between. We're going to have some algorithms to solve for detector locations for these smugglers and based on looking at those detector locations we can get some nice qualitative intuition about what are good detector locations. So here's a way of simplifying the problem a little bit so we can think about it. Let's just replace the transportation network with a grid. Let's replace the smuggler with this mouse, his destination with this piece of cheese, and the border where we might place some nuclear detectors with these blue cells. In the existing models and the conservative models, when the mouse picks a direction, he moves in that direction with certainty. So he has total control on exactly where he's moving. But let's change that a little bit. Now let's have it that when the mouse picks a direction, he moves in that d direction with probability 1 minus A. And there's some small chance that he randomly gets bumped in another direction. So with probability A, he gets bumped in one of these three other directions. Now what this is modeling is that the smuggler is still smart, he's still making intelligent decisions, but when he goes to execute a decision, something happens. He gets scared, maybe he sees some police officer on the road, and so instead of executing the decision that he planned, he executes some other decision, and that's represented by getting bumped here. So let's compare these two models and see uh, how they actually produce paths. And in particular, let's see why the model that we choose really makes a difference in terms of the kind of predictions that come out of the model. So to be able to apply these models, we need some data on the transportation network. And what we're using here is a database developed by Los Alamos National Laboratory called the Patriot Database. It includes all roads, railroads, airports, and seaports of countries throughout the world. It includes border crossings. It includes some nuclear facilities. It also has detection probabilities on uh, the individual edges of the network. So when I first got this database, I just tried running some paths through it to see if it's giving me reasonable results in terms of smuggler paths. So here I just ran a path from Peshawar to Paris. 
And uh, it took this particular route uh, to get from Peshawar to Paris. So I looked up uh, what smuggling routes people might use from Afghanistan into Western Europe. And it turns out that the US State Department lists a very well-known route for smuggling drugs called the Balkan route that goes through Turkey, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Albania, and Italy, and then the rest of Western Europe. And when we look at the network, it gives us Turkey, Bulgaria, Serbia, Slovenia, Italy, and then Western Europe. And so it really matches very well with what actually happens in the real world. Here's another example of why the movement model matters. In this example, I'm looking at trying to find a path from Peshawar to Mumbai. Uh, and if you find the shortest path, which is just the one that has minimum distance, what happens is the smuggler heads south, crosses the Indian border here, and then uh, gets to Mumbai. But if you look at the safest route, what happens is they start at Peshawar, they head to Karachi, and then they take a boat from Karachi to Mumbai. And I ran this particular model about five days after the terrorist attack in Mumbai. And this was exactly the path that the terrorists took to attack those hotels in Mumbai. They took a boat from Karachi and they went to Mumbai that way because that's the safest route. And so the mathematical model here is really predicting that very well. So what happens if we add some bumps? So here the smuggler is getting bumped as he's moving through the network. And what happens is even with these bumps, the smuggler still heads to Karachi and takes the path from Karachi to Mumbai. So this path is so much better than any other path that even when the smuggler randomly gets bumped off of it, he's going to try to get back on it uh, to take that boat from Karachi to Mumbai. So really, the network predicts this to be the safest path that a smuggler might take. So now that we have these various movement models and we understand how using the right movement model can really have a big effect on the kind of predictions uh, that come out of the network, let's take a look at how do we actually solve for the detector locations uh, on this network. And the mathematics here is actually reasonably complicated but the algorithm has a really simple interpretation. You can think of it just as a two-player game of a smuggler versus an interdictor. And the two-player game proceeds as follows. First, the smuggler computes some paths. So the smuggler says, this is how I would smuggle the material. Then the interdictor says, OK, well, if you smuggle the material that way, I would place my detectors here. Then we go back to the smuggler, who now says, OK, well, if you place your detectors here, uh, this is how I would move, or this is how I would change my paths. And the next time the interdictor places his detectors, he remembers all of the responses that he's seen from the smuggler in the past to place his detectors. So let's just see a small example of this. So this is the very first iteration of this game. The smuggler just says, these are the paths I would take from these origins to these destinations. And you can see this is one of these bump models that provides an entire swath of paths from an origin to a destination. So given these paths, we would place the detectors here, and the smuggler adjusts his route. So if you look here, for example, in the northeast, when we place that detector, the smuggler just walked around it. So now the second time we place detectors, we're going to take into account both the original paths and these paths. So given these two plants from the smuggler, it turns out to be best to place the detectors here. And now we've seen a third plan from the smuggler. The next time we compute, we're going to co take into account all those three plans and so forth until eventually we get to the optimal detector placement, which happens to be this uh, in this particular example. So what are, where are we in terms of smuggler movement models? Well, the conservative movement model is now very, very fast. We can very quickly solve for detector locations in this model. And this wasn't the case 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, it took maybe a day to solve this model on a USA-sized instance. But today, we can solve 
150 instances of this problem in about 30 seconds. For this random walk model, the one where the smuggler is not very smart, it's also very fast, and it's even fast when we consider multiple borders on which we might place detectors. So maybe we're not only placing detectors on the U.S. border, but we also want to take a look at simultaneously the Mexico border. For this bump model, things are still somewhat difficult. We can just begin to solve USA sized instances, but it's very slow. So it maybe takes a day to figure out what are the optimal detector placement locations for that. But let's take a look at uh, some intuition on what are good detector placement locations that came out of these models. And this is something that really translates very well from one problem instance to another. And the intuition here is that it's useful to use naturally occurring geographic obstacles. So for example, uh, this is a solution that comes out of just the conservative movement model. So here these detectors are placed on the Mexico border because what they're using is the naturally occurring obstacle of the Chihuahuan Desert to force the smugglers to move a slightly longer path. So we want to use these naturally occurring obstacles. In this example with the bump model, uh, we're using the mountains here in the northwest to force the smuggler to move over the mountains and then back into Seattle if that's where he wants to go. And a similar thing happens in the random walk model. So essentially, regardless of what model you use, it's very important to place these detectors around geographically occurring barriers because that makes your detector more powerful. You're forcing the smuggler to walk even farther to avoid your detector. The smuggler movement models I told you about really do get used for real world situations. For example, they were used by the United States to place detectors on Russian border crossings. They were also used in 2004 to place detectors around the Olympic Games to make sure that no nuclear material got smuggled into Olympic game venues. And they were also used to inform placing detectors on the US railroad network. So I've told you mostly about large-scale models that look at the entire transportation network, but the also local-scale models exist. So for example, consider that we're just working within one city, and these are maybe the city blocks of my city. One idea is that people have had is to just put detectors on taxi cabs or police cars, and we're going to put this in every car, so these are going to be very cheap detectors, and these detectors are going to be wrong sometimes. So in this picture, for example, Imagine that there's some nuclear material here at this white dot and uh, these yellow lines represent cars that have a detector but the detector hasn't sounded an alarm. So in other words, the count of the radiation isn't too high. And then uh, these red cars represent cars that have sounded an alarm because their detector is counting very high amounts of radiation. And some of these cars, uh, this happens because they're close to the source. And some of these cars, it doesn't happen because of that. It just happens because the detector is cheap and it's not very good. And so it's giving us a false alarm over here. But what happens is, as your cars are moving throughout the city and you're getting these alerts, even though some of them are wrong, you can aggregate those alerts over time to really get a picture of where it's likely in your city to find some nuclear material. And that's what uh, this graph here represents, that we're really, over time, uh, able to localize the source of the radiation to a particular intersection. So I'd like to just end by telling you a little bit about the current and future work on smuggler interdiction and smuggler movement models. In particular, so far I've told you about how you could go about optimizing the budget of how many detectors you should buy and where to place them. But in a large scale effort, you really have many decisions to make. In particular, you one decision would be, should I fund tr training for local law enforcement or should I spend my money going and buying a detector? And so you can incorporate these kinds of questions into the mathematical model that you use to answer what's the best way to stop these nuclear smugglers. We're also working on getting 
computer software that works faster for this bump model that can solve uh, many instances of this model to let us know what's the best place to put detectors against smugglers that uh, we're not exactly sure what path they're going to take. And finally, and this is maybe the most interesting direction of future work, is that the way that smugglers move is very much affected by the social network. So in particular, if you know that this smuggler is from a particular group, and that particular group has a large base in this particular city, it might be natural to assume that this smuggler is going to go through that city on his route because in that city he has some safe houses, he knows people who are going to help him get through the city. And so incorporating the social network into the smuggler movement uh, really becomes an important part of being able to predict routes and that's something that uh, we're working on. So thank you very much for listening.